Welcome to another program we call Perspectives El Paso. I'm Leon Blevins, Professor of Government at El Paso Community College. This is April of 2015. And just recently here in El Paso City and the county area, we've had a number of tragic incidences of double deaths, a man killing his wife and then himself. Or in one case, I believe it was a female killing a man and then killing herself. These tragic circumstances once again stress something that we've had discussed on this program before about sexual and domestic violence within our society. In the past, I've had someone from the Center Against Family Violence, uh, if I remember the name, Oscar Hernandez and Jesus Arebe, a police officer named Huddleston. I did a program with Stephanie Schulte where we talked about rape and helping those who have found themselves in such a situation, rape crisis counseling. These are stories we should not have to have. We should have better people. We should have a better society. But there will always be violence. There's been violence since the period of Cain and Abel in the biblical story of old times. But I have someone here today on the program, Stephanie Carr, and she's going to talk to us about what we can do to make El Paso a better place, to avoid violence, and then also what to do when we find ourselves having to deal with it. Stephanie, thanks for being with us. You're welcome. Delighted to be here today. Yeah, the reason that I contacted you is because there was a long article, a very good article, an interview, I think with David Crowder for El Paso, Inc. Exactly. And, uh, and then we saw the newspaper article in the El Paso Times, I believe it was, about the name of your center being changed. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember when your center first opened. I was out of town for a number of years, came back in 1972. And then in the late 70s, I remember that some of my students began to work as volunteers with the center with regard to family violence. Uh, and once in a while I'd have a student come to me and want counseling uh -huh. and talk about what was happening to them, emotional violence and sometimes physical violence. Some talked to me about problems in their family with incest and, and, and cases of rape. Right. And I found myself, I'd been a counselor before, a trained uh -huh. counselor, pastor of churches and things like that. And so I was open to these kind of things and you've seen this all along. Tell us about that. When did the center actually begin and who were some of the people started it? So you have a, a, a great memory. Uh, the center started really in 1977 by a group of El Paso women that were concerned about family violence. Mm -hmm. And they really started answering hotline calls in their own homes, had these calls directed into their own homes and set up a series of safe houses. Ruth Kern and Iris Burnham were two of those five women. I met women those two. I met those two women. Uh, didn't know them well, but they were really Real pioneer nice. women yeah. in El Paso. And so really these five women took, took it upon themselves to start what was then known as the Shelter for Battered Women. Mm -hmm. So we started as a small organization. After those network of safe houses became an inadequate a response wow. to the issue, which did not take long. Uh, a local church donated a space, and that was when the first shelter opened. So over then, the last 35, 36 years, the Shelter for Battered Women has transformed and become what today is known as the Center Against Sexual and Family Violence. Mm -hmm. So we've really had a long period of growth in these past many years to encompass not only providing a shelter, which is one of the things that we still do today, but to expand to counseling and support and advocacy and addressing sexual violence and the needs of survivors and families who have encountered this violence or trauma in their lives. I've done two programs over these years with the uh, Center for the Children Who Are Being Abused. Mm -hmm the Child Crisis Center. Uh -huh. Al Velarde now is chairing that and heading that. And uh, so there's a close relationship between all of these things that are happening. Violence right. toward children, violence toward other adults in the family, sometimes even leading to death. And so one time I had a student ask me the question, a young man said, Mr. Blevins, what do you think are the two greatest problems in our country? I said, I can tell you real fast. One is discrimination in all of its forms uh -huh. and the other is drug abuse in all of its forms. 
especially cigarettes, the big killer. Mm. But alcohol changes the way people are thinking and feeling. They may be very nice people until they get drunk. Mm -hmm. And then they're affecting their brain and sometimes they become mean, vicious, and deadly. Deal with that. Well, what we know about family violence or, or the cycle of violence is, n number one, that it can happen in any family. It crosses all socioeconomic barriers and all genders. Uh, you mentioned earlier that there's been recent incidents of family violence right. where, where the woman is the aggressor and the male has been the victim. Right. And people go, well, how could that be? But the, we certainly know that that can happen. When we think about the dynamics of violence, especially family violence, where the real heart of it is around power over another person and controlling their life. Substance abuse, alcohol, drugs can play a role in that, but it's not the cause of it. Right. Uh, the, really the cause of this kind of cyclical <laughs> violence that happens is related to a person's determination to control another person. Oftentimes, people think that uh, an incident of family violence is an anger management problem, that you just lose your temper. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's the opposite in, in our experience because the violence that's perpetrated, whether it's emotional or verbal or sexual or physical, is really directed at an individual. So a person with an anger management problem is going to get mad at their boss, they're going to get mad at the grocery store clerk, they're going to get mad at professors, mm -hmm. uh, they're going to get mad at all kinds of people <coughs> and lose their temper everywhere. Mm -hmm. A person who is really an aggressor of family violence or sexual violence is targeting that violence specifically at one person and is very controlled and very deliberate. That begins very young because young children seeing their father, say, abusing their mother, they're learning by example. Exactly. One of the most profound stories I heard about that, I was working with a, a elementary school principal and he was talking about a second grade little boy <clears throat> who was sent to his office because he'd been hitting a girl on the playground. And so, you know, the little boy goes into the principal's office and he says, so, Johnny, I understand you've been hitting this girl on the playground. And he said, well, yes, but it's okay. And he said, well, why is it okay? And he said, well, because she's my girlfriend. Mind you, this little boy's seven years old. And so the principal said, well, if she is your girlfriend, you should like her and not want to hurt her. And the little boy just pretty matter-of-factly said, well, my dad hits my mom, and he loves my mom, and it's okay there, mm -hmm. so it's okay if I hit her. Mm -hmm. And so at age seven, that <coughs> mindset of violence is okay has already been established in a really young child. How do you deal with that? What does your organization, now you're combined here, mm -hmm. do you go out into schools, do you have programs, mm -hmm. do you have pamphlets, booklets, videos to try to deal with this? We do. We spend a lot of time in uh, elementary schools, middle schools, and high schools. Um, starting in elementary school, working with kids talking about bullying. Mm -hmm. So that bullying can really be a symptom of violence in the home or a movement towards thinking that it's okay to hurt someone else and that there aren't consequences for that and, and it's acceptable. In middle school, our work begins <coughs> to talk about healthy relationships and boyfriends, girlfriends, because I'm telling you, in middle school, um, which was not the case when I was in middle school, but kids are having boyfriends and girlfriends. By the time we get to high school students, we're working with what we call our No Means No project in healthy relationships, where we're spending time talking to high school kids. Last year, over 15,000 high school kids around what the law says related to sexual relationships, what's the age of consent, what happens when you send a picture of yourself in a compromising situation to someone else over the phone. And so there are all levels of work that we're doing with students to really change that cycle early on. I started doing school programs in 1973 here in mm -hmm. El Paso, going mm -hmm. dressed as characters like Abraham Lincoln and George Washington and Davy Crockett and so on. And I noticed that I would go into schools, I never heard the kids cursing and using the bad words, the mm -hmm. F words, the S words and so on. <clears throat> but in more recent years going in, walking down the hallway, I hear the kids using those words. Mm -hmm. They pick a lot of them up from their parents in some cases or peer 
or sometimes from the media. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with the media that is saturated with violence and vulgarity? Mm -hmm. Well, I can't disagree with you. Certainly, if you turn on the television or you go to a variety of websites, you can see almost anything that you want to see. One of the things that we're really trying to focus on is how do we have a community in El Paso that says violence is not okay in, in whatever form it's in. So with elementary school kids, it meaning you have a culture in a school where it's not okay to hit. Uh, up to adults where you have our county attorney as you have uh, pictured oh, yes, here the way, on the table. I, I had Joanne Bernal on my program fairly recently. Good. And a wonderful lady. <clears throat> and at some point in that conversation, we talked about court orders. Mm -hmm. And we'll get to that whenever you want to okay. bring that up. Okay. Let's talk about that. Okay. Well, good, because <clears throat> her program with um, teens in schools is no te dejas, don't let yourself. Um, and how do we respond as a community where we see someone yelling uh, on the street to someone else or see someone um, in a dangerous situation, but we turn our head and say, you know what, that's their business, that's not my business. What do you do when you hear a neighbor next door where you know that there's a fight going on and you just turn up your music or your TV a little louder because it's not your business? Our point is that it should be our business and that if you intervene in violence in a safe way, and there are ways to do it safely, that we create a culture in a community that says violence is not okay. It's not okay to be hurting other people. See something, say something, right? Exactly, exactly. Okay. The same, same message that goes out about dealing with terrorism. Mm -hmm. In a way, this is terrorism within the family. It is. It is. In fact, I've, I defined terrorism one time in a set of notes I had for my classes, and, and some woman says, isn't that kind of broad? I said, yes, but terrorism reaches into all aspects mm -hmm. of life. It's not just people that are blowing up airplanes or trade center buildings. A drunk driver is a terrorist. Mm -hmm. and then in, I, I, have, I wrote an article for MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, the regional uh, pamphlet, and, and I call it that, unintended terrorist. Mm -hmm. Some of these, they'll say, I didn't intend to hurt you. But here's another syndrome you run into as a counselor in this area, is sometimes the person who's the victim is made to feel guilty. It's your fault. Well, we certainly do that both in family violence and in sexual violence. And so there is quite a bit of what we call in our vernacular victim blaming. Mm -hmm. So if there is a survivor of sexual assault, it's why did you go out with him? What were you wearing to the party? Why were you drinking? Mm -hmm. What did you do that egged him on? Mm -hmm. And so she's in a position of having to justify her actions or behaviors, and we're not asking the aggressor those questions. Mm -hmm. Why did you commit this horrendous act of violence? Uh, within a family violence situation where Almost always there's been a pattern of verbal and emotional abuse that then escalates to physical violence. Uh, the response often from family members is, if you would just be a better spouse, if you would be nicer, if you would get the laundry done earlier, if you would get dinner on the table on time, then you wouldn't be in a situation where you're gonna get hurt that's really blaming the victim for violence that's perpetrated on that individual and not holding the aggressor accountable for his or her actions. We have another danger in this mix and that's the easy access to guns, mm -hmm. weapons of all kinds. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in the case one time, got a call from a student, help, come and help us, come and help us. And I've been in some counseling with the daughter of that family and the son-in-law in this kind of problem, the verbal and then physical abuse. But I ran over and it was not that case. It was the daughter in that family who discovered her husband was having an affair. Mm -hmm. And she'd grabbed a butcher knife and went chasing him around in the kitchen around the table. And so I was just about three blocks away and went over there and he'll talk her down, took the knife out of her hand. Sometimes things happen just mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. and can be deadly right. or dangerous for the family and leave memories in the children who are standing there seeing this kind of thing happening mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and not understanding why is this right. happening. Well, there's plenty of research that shows that if there is a gun in the home and there's domestic violence, that the likelihood of serious physical danger and 
or homicide right. uh, is significantly increased. And so having a gun in the home means when you are in a violent situation, it's easy to pull out a gun and hurt someone deadly very quickly. Um, if you look at the last four incidents in El Paso that you were talking about at the beginning of the show that's just happened <clears throat> in the last four or five weeks, horrible deaths. Um, guns have been involved in all of them. Uh, with the exception of one stabbing where it was a murder-suicide where the husband stabbed his wife to death and mm -hmm. then shot himself with with a gun. And um, I was talking to a former law enforcement officer just a few days ago and he said, well, I think you should just teach women how to handle guns and they all should have a gun to protect themselves. And my response to that was, is that Guns are dangerous in the hands of potential victims because they don't know how to use them. They pull them out, they get taken away mm -hmm. from them and turned and used on them. And right. any time a weapon is within the environment, the, the chances of it being used to kill someone is, is so much greater. So that's part of that. When we talk about changing our culture, it, is it okay to keep that? revolver in your bedroom closet in case the intruder comes in. Mm -hmm. Probably not. I can tell cases after cases. I, I don't have time to do that. We don't have time on the show. But let me, I mentioned, I remember when your center opened, mm -hmm. the Center for Battered Women, when it was called that at first, and then a, a place opened where we could donate things. Mm -hmm. And I used to go down and donate. And then you built a place on Giles. You want us to give a telephone number address so people that want to help financially or with things. I remember we started giving cell phones. When we mm -hmm. get new cell phones, exactly. we would give cell phones that could be programmed for women to have right. or whoever's being abused right. to make quick contact. Give us information. Sure. Our Family Resource Center, which is our public facility, is at 580 Giles, the corner of Giles and Carolina. Mm -hmm. So our Counseling Center is there, our Advocates Center is there, our Youth Services are there, and our Administration. So it's also the place where donations can be brought. They can be clothing, food, supplies, linens, paper products, diapers, mm -hmm. any of those things. Uh, financial assistance is always more then welcome. And so what we do with donations, first of all, is to use them with our clients at our shelter or those clients who are using our Family Resource Center, and then distribute them according to who needs them. What we find is that, especially in our shelter, which last year housed 952 people, mm -hmm. that the amount of supplies that we use, as you can imagine, is huge. So if you just think about what you use in your house in terms of opening all your cupboard doors and all the things that are in your house that you use every day, we use that in our house, in our shelter every day, except for you need to multiply it by about 50 because on any given day, we'll have between 50 to 100 people. I think today we probably have 62. I haven't looked exactly, mm -hmm. but close to that. So the community can think about that as a way to help. Anything that you use in your home, we use in our home. So 580 Giles is the address to bring those donations. In terms of help, really importantly is to know our Crisis Hope Line number, which is 593-7300. That number has a person answering it 24-7 that can provide information, help getting into the shelter, education, a place to turn to, a comforting ear to listen to you talk. And, and so we average about 700 calls a month on our Hope Line call. It takes all the rape crisis calls and all the sexual assault calls in addition to domestic violence calls. Okay, we're getting fairly close to the end of this program. Uh, let me give you a chance to talk about a success story, something right. in your mind. I know you've had so many, I've had so many. But something that is a crystal story, I asked that of Joanne Bernal, mm -hmm, and she gave mm -hmm. me one in this particular area. Mm -hmm. uh, what about a, a success story? You don't have to name the person if you sure, want to. Sure, sure. Um, we have a person right now who is on our board of directors now, who is a former survivor of domestic violence, and many years ago turned to us when that situation had escalated and her safety and that of her children were at jeopardy. Mm -hmm. She sought out help 
in shelter and proceeded to use a variety of services at our program, support groups, counseling, and has managed to become economically self-sufficient, a businesswoman, and, and really is now in the position where she is giving back volunteering her time at the center because she can really say, I've had this experience, I understand it from, from the inside. And mm -hmm. so I, that's just a tremendous path to walk down. Um, she, takes, she talks about it in terms of a path and a journey mm -hmm. and people holding her hands along, along that journey. And it's just a very um, inspiring story for well, all of us. Oh my, we hear those. Uh, just yesterday here in El Paso, Yucca Park, mm -hmm. There was an event, Jaime Esparza, our district attorney was there and others. I wasn't able to get there for the event, but there's a memorial wall there with names of people mm -hmm. who have been killed, who have been violent acts against them. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my former students, uh, Kristen Dibler, and her mother Carol, who was a teacher at Bellar High School, their names are there. And Kristen had a boyfriend, changed boyfriends, and her old boyfriend came to the house and shot and killed her. Her mother came to assist him, and she died. So there are tragic stories like this. But we can draw strength from the fact that these families, we saw some on television last mm -hmm, night and mm -hmm. on this morning, talking about things about their relatives, their mm -hmm, loved ones, mm -hmm. what they meant. And this is one of the saddest parts, is because when an act of violence takes place, whether it ends in death or not death, it affects many other people. Absolutely. There's a ripple effect. It's like the rock thrown into the water. Mm -hmm. It goes on. And as one woman said yesterday, this goes, this is a life sentence mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. This is a life sentence for, for um, um, Kristen and Carol's relatives and exactly. friends and Bob, the, the father right. in that family. So many are affected by it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, when they're doing these, they're not even thinking about yeah. their family. Right. Can you imagine being the father or mother of someone mm -hmm. who does a horrendous act? Mm -hmm. I had a student years ago, he and a buddy of his over at Sunland Park, New Mexico, broke into a house, raped the woman, the two little girls killed them while the father was at work at the jail. And later they were caught because they threw the gun out out on War Road and it was found. And the people in those families are given a life sentence. Mm -hmm. Don't you see that with the people you work with? Absolutely. Um, I, I was at uh, the memorial yesterday. It's always a moving e event. And um, District Attorney Sparsa read a very powerful poem that our local poet laureate uh, Ben Sines wrote about remembering. And so when we remember victims, we of course think about their lives and, and how tragically they were cut so young. And, and then we talked also in that poem, but at that event, about families and the long-term effect. And, and while it's sad, it's also a very poignant and uh, comforting time to spend at that park and on that day to see families really come together and spend the day and rejoice in their memories right. in kind of a bittersweet way. But as you mentioned, you think about the families of those who commit the acts and uh, the tragedy that those families oh, bear as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I've been there soon after they put up that memorial wall mm -hmm. and started putting names on there. Uh, now there are what, over 1,500 names mm -hmm. on, on that wall. And, what they say yesterday, 50 something this last mm -hmm. year. And sometimes just the quiet there of putting my hand on that wall, and there's several I know there mm -hmm. that have been killed. Uh, over the years, I've had at least three of my students have been killed mm -hmm. in various things, Kristen being one of them. And so I'm just, just to spend some time there mm -hmm. and pray and think about the consequences, even for the families that are left. They mm -hmm. mourn and they can go there every year and, and praise the Lord that they had time with them. Mm -hmm periods of the crystal moments that were good moments, even though there was a bad one. Right, right. They're still there. We have just about three minutes left. Tell us anything else that you'd like to about the, the center that you have and a new name and your activities. Okay. One of the things that, that we haven't mentioned yet, but that is an important program uh, what we, of what the Center Against Sexual and Family Di Violence does, is our Batterers Intervention and Prevention Program. Okay. So we know that there are survivors of domestic violence and and sexual assault, and we certainly work with them in our shelter and at our Family Resource Center. But we also know that there's 
there are individuals who commit those acts who are aggressors. So on North Piedra Street, we run a batter's intervention and prevention program, which is a certified program um, that holds aggressors accountable for their behavior. It's a series of 26 classes that meet once a week, certified by the Office of the Attorney General. And generally, our participants are individuals who have been ordered by the court as a result of a conviction of assault family violence to participate in this program. So as they go through these 26 weeks of classes, um, the, the topics are around accountability and responsibility for behavior and the dynamics of violence. We talked about those. Mm -hmm. So if there has been a lifetime cycle of violence and you grew up in that, how do you, how do you change your uh, attitude towards verbal violence or emotional violence. And what we found uh, with that program over the last two to three years is that we track the re-arrest records of individuals who have completed all 26 of those classes and taken the final test and done the exit interview. And for those who successfully complete that project, uh, the recidivism rate is less than 10%. So, I'm, I'm an optimistic yeah. <laughs> person, I have to be in this business, but we also can see that um, with real determination and focus that dynamics, dynamics can be changed, oh, and, time and that's it? important. We're being told our time is gone, okay. but that's a positive note, Indeed. that things can be changed. The Child Crisis Center now has a new fatherhood program helping young people and right. others to be better fathers mm -hmm. and less likely to be batterers. Exactly. Stephanie, it's been wonderful to have you You're here and welcome. get this word Thank out. Thank you for including a, me today. One of the most important things being done in El Paso, Texas. Thank you, sir. And being go going on since the late 1970s. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Leon Blevins at El Paso Community College.